That's our text this morning. If you'd like to open your Bible to John chapter 11, putting in at verse 45. John chapter 11, verse 45. If you're here or new to Calvary, we are studying the Gospel of John uh, chapter by chapter and verse by verse. The topic, Mary anoints Jesus with costly ointment, wiping his feet with her hair. The title of our message, Glad Hair Day. God, I pray that you would uh, reveal yourself in a really beautiful way to your saints and uh, to those, Lord, who are outside of your kingdom here. I've said this many times, Lord, but it's so precious that you walk in the midst of the candlestick, the candlestick being your church on earth. And so though you're omnipresent and we don't need to be in one particular place to hear from you, you said, Lord, you would be someplace when we got together and we want to be where you are. So thank you for this gathering. And we thank you that the Holy Spirit is our true teacher and that he will take the word of God and bring it to our hearts in a proper, wonderful way. We thank you in Jesus' name and everyone who agreed said, amen. Aggressive inline skating, all-terrain boarding, bonsai skydiving, BMX, bungee jumping, canyoning, cliff diving, Remember the guy on Wide World of Sports? Every year they have the cliff diving competition in Mexico. Who remembers? God bless you. Cluster ballooning, whatever that is, and deep water soloing, that's a partial list of extreme sports. We admire the athletes who give it their all. There are two extremes in our text. Mary went to an extreme when she took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard worth a year's wages, we'll find out, anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The Jewish ruling council was dominated by extremists who plotted to put Jesus to death. Mary's belief in Jesus made her available to wash his feet with ointment and her hair. Unbelief drove the Jewish rulers to murder. I'll organize my comments around two points. You are oppressed by unbelief, and number two, you press on by believing. In chapter 11, you are oppressed by unbelief. Seattle police arrested street preacher Matthew Meineke on charges of being a risk to public safety. He was reading his Bible aloud at a public park near a pride event. SPD has enough resources to send 10 police officers to arrest a preacher reading his Bible in a public park, Meineke wrote on Twitter, posting a video showing his arrest. According to Gallup, the pollster, a record low 20% of Americans now say the Bible is the literal word of God. 20%. Our study in the literal word of God finds us in John chapter 11, verse 45 where we are going to see uh, many things, but one of them is the parallel between uh, a, a society breaking down uh, and the book of Romans, as we'll get to it in a minute. Our study in the literal word, verse 45, then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did believed in him. Many Jews gathered to mourn the death of Lazarus. Jesus ruined the funeral when he commanded Lazarus to come out of the tomb. Can't have much of a funeral without a dead person. And so that was the end of that. Have you ruined a family celebration or two by representing Jesus? I know Thanksgiving people dread, uh, come up to me and they said they dread some of their family that's going to be there because they get into these arguments and discussions and all. Uh, especially when in my life when I was first saved, uh, you, know, you know a lot about my family. I don't know that you could say that we were a close-knit family, but we were a lot closer before I became a Christian uh, because that, that was like a death knell uh, and uh, lots of arguments, uh, especially with my dad, my older brother and such. And so you know what I'm talking about. So, and, and I don't think, obviously Jesus doesn't ruin it. He, he redeems it. It's the person in unbelief who's ruining the time because they won't listen to that which is most important. Uh, and so uh, many of them believed. John wrote this gospel, he says, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life 
in his name. Non-believers are commanded to believe and be born again. And we see that throughout this gospel. But believers are also encouraged. They're encouraged to continue in the spirit, believing God's word is his enabling to obey. And so, uh, yes, we have brand new believers read this because it, it bolsters their belief. But chapter after chapter, it's been ministering to us that since you are a believer, you should believe all the things that Jesus said and return to that, uh, that infant faith, that, that you know, faith that you first had as a baby Christian and just take God at his word, knowing that his spirit empowers you. Verse 46, some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things Jesus did. Why do some believe and others remain in their unbelief? As the Beach Boys sang, God only knows. Remember that song? Sure you do. Beach Boys. There are Christians who claim that they know. They propose that before creation, God chose certain human beings to save by irresistible grace. He simultaneously passed over the majority of human beings, consigning them to eternal punishment simply because he did not choose to chose them. Right? It'll help you to remember. God did not choose to chose them. They weren't his chosen, and so they just go directly to hell. They don't stop, go, you know, they just go right there. Thankfully, there are other ways, biblical ways, scholarly ways of approaching this issue that preserve both God's sovereignty and our free will. In the end, why some and not others are saved is a matter of grace and faith between the Savior and each individual. What we know for certain is that Jesus draws all men to himself. He is the Savior of all men, especially those who believe, and whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And the only way to not understand that is to twist it into some uh, theology uh, rather than just take it at face value. Verse 47, then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, what are we going to do? For this man works many signs. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and nation. The council is the 70-man Supreme Court of Israel known as the Sanhedrin. They were Israel's authority subject to Rome's final authority. The Sanhedrin could not deny the many signs Jesus did. The blind received sight, the lame walked, those who had leprosy were cured, the deaf heard, the dead were raised, and the good news was preached to the poor. Some of you should know where to find the world's oldest still in use sign. Anybody know off the top of your head? Just raise your hand. It's the world's oldest street sign that's still in use. It's a yield sign. It dates back to 1686. It's along Salvador Street. You know where it is now? No? In Alfama, in Lisbon, in Portugal. God bless you. So I'm just giving you Portuguese some, some bragging here. You know, you say, hey, you guys might have invented, you know, sliced bread, but we have the oldest sign that's still in use in the world. Yeah, that says something to me. Old signs remain accurate. The signs posted by Jesus during his three and a half years on earth still point to him. They are no less real, no less demanding of a response. The ensuing centuries have added credibility, seeing the effect that Jesus has had on the world. People say, well, if I saw this and that and the other thing, I would come to Christ. You see that in the Bible, the literal word of God. These are literal historic events that are attested to. Uh, in the same way other historic events are attested to. Think of all the things you've never seen in history that you believe happened. Well, these things happened, and, and so we, we don't need the signs because Jesus did them already. The Sanhedrin was concerned uh, about this because they thought that the people would try to make Jesus king, and they were right. Rome was not going to tolerate that, their place, meaning the temple, could be destroyed as it was in the past by many other empires. Their very existence as a nation was jeopardized. Interestingly, they were worried that if they crowned Jesus king, they would be destroyed and their temple ruined. Because they didn't crown Jesus king in 70 AD, their temple was destroyed and the town was ruined. 
Verse 49, and one of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not that the whole nation should perish. He told the Sanhedrin they didn't know what they were talking about. He saw this as an opportunity to enlist Rome's help, eliminating Jesus. Now this he did not say on his own, verse 51, but being high priest that year, he was the reigning high priest, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for that nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. The Bible Knowledge Commentary says, Caiaphas pointed to the last sacrificial lamb in a prophecy he did not even know he made. Caiaphas meant Jesus had to be killed to save the nation from Rome, but God intended his words as a reference to Jesus' substitutionary atonement. And so, the, you know, this godless man looks at Jesus and says he could die and save the nation. And God says, yeah, that's actually what's going to happen. It's an irony, but it's going to happen spiritually, not militarily. Jesus would die for the nation, not to preserve the status quo, but as the last sacrifice Israel would ever need, the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the nation and the world. Those scattered abroad probably refers to Jews living outside the Holy Land. True, Jesus is the Savior of the whole world, Jew and Gentile, but the church isn't so much in view right now as Jesus ends his earthly ministry. He's still offering the kingdom to the nation of Israel. And just as an aside, we talk about prophecy a lot here and have our updates. One of the key um, foundations, I guess you would say, of our understanding of prophecy is that the nation of Israel, the physical descendants of Abraham, is not to be confused with the church of Jesus Christ. They are two separate entities in God's plan for the world. And why so many people get confused about there, you know, not being real prophecies, it's an all an allegory, it's always been fulfilled already, is because they confuse Israel with the church. I just had a long discussion on Twitter with some people about uh, Matthew 24 and 25, and they, they literally cannot understand it because it's mostly about Israel, and they don't acknowledge that Israel has anything to do with anything. Uh, and so it's, it's interesting. So keep Israel and, and the church apart. Uh, by the way, the church, we're told, is a mystery revealed in the New Testament, so it can't be Israel. Uh, so anyway, keep that in mind as you're studying. Verse 53, then from that day on, they plotted to put him to death. Your top religious guys, starting with the longtime high priest, are starring in Godfather 3. That corrupt church, uh, more corrupt than Michael Corleone, who wants to go straight. And so it's sad. These were religious men who thought they pleased God by being self-righteous, and they were going to put a man to death, and that man happened to be the son of man. Dr. J. Vernon McGee said there are only two kinds of religion in the world. One says do, only Christianity says done. Christ has done it all. When you trust in good works to earn your salvation, you become capable of the worst works imaginable. Religion kills and destroys. So does philosophy and psychology and every other man-made substitute for salvation in Jesus Christ. You can only be transformed and become a new creation and receive a new heart by believing in Jesus Christ. Those things are not available anywhere else. Religion and things like it can lead to reformation, and it's better to be a reformed drunk, let's say, than remain a drunk, but you're still an unsaved sinner. You're not transformed. Religion and the like can lead to deformation. Certain beliefs distort, twist, they warp their adherence into doing truly heinous things in the light of their God. And so it's, it's terrible. Now I've lost my place because my finger fell. Hang on. No, not there. There it is. That'll get edited out, I hope. Nicodemus was a member of this council. So was Joseph of Arimathea, who will come forward to claim Jesus' body boldly after his crucifixion. Two godly men among the 70. Maybe there were a few more. What must that have been like, to be in that minority and 
had the organization that you were part of planning the murder of an innocent man. During World War II, German Lutheran pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer was known for his resistance to the Nazi regime. He had a vocal opposition to Hitler's euthanasia program and genocidal persecution of the Jews. He was arrested in April of 1943 by the Gestapo, accused of being associated with the plot to assassinate Hitler. He was hanged April 9, 1945, not long before the end of the war. If it hasn't happened already or isn't happening right now, one day you are going to find yourself before or on some council or board or organization that is in opposition to what you believe about Jesus Christ. God the Holy Spirit will give you the humility and boldness to act accordingly. Who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as that. Therefore, Jesus no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there into the country near the wilderness to a city called Ephraim, and there remained with his disciples. Not out of fear did Jesus no longer walk openly. I think we'd agree that he was the one person who did not fear. His public ministry was ending. His attention was now on his passion, which would begin the following day. And so he wasn't running from these rulers. He was uh, it was strategic to be where he was, and also he was in preparation. And the Passover of the Jews was near, and many went from the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. This is the third Passover in the Gospel of John, and it's the last one for Jesus. This is the one he will be sacrificed as the sin uh, for the once for all Lamb of God for taking away the sins of the world. The Apostle Paul would rightly say, for indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. And so the Lord would fulfill all of the symbolism of the Passover and end that for life. Take a message. Then they saw, Tom, I can't talk right now, I'm in a Bible study. Uh, then they saw Jesus and spoke among themselves as they stood in the temple saying, what do you think, that he's gonna come or not? Now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a command that if anyone knew where he was, he should report it, that they might seize him. They should have called this the festival of fear. The populace knew that the rulers had excommunicated a man born blind on account that Jesus healed him. Now they issued a blanket bolo. Everyone was in similar danger. If you saw Jesus or knew of his whereabouts, you would become an accomplice if you didn't turn him in and maybe get kicked out of the synagogue and the temple, which meant the end of your social life. Many infirm individuals undoubtedly were hoping to encounter Jesus at the Passover in order to receive a much yearned for healing. These times, uh, uh, you know, at the uh, feasting would draw people from all over and not just the, you know, the infirm and the lame and the sick in Jerusalem, but from all over. And especially this year, because you've been hearing for the last two, three and a half years that there's a man on the earth and when people go to him, and sometimes when they don't even get to him, they're completely healed of all their infirmities and everything is brand new in their life. And I mean, I don't mean to be weird about it, but you crawl or you're carried or some other way you get to Jerusalem in the terrible state that you're in, blind, deaf, maimed, lame, whatever, and you find out that your religious leaders have called for a wanted dead or alive situation for this man they ought to have been cooperating with Jesus to see their people healed and blessed. But all they could think about was their own situation, their own status, their own political power, and they overlooked that. As far as shepherds go, they were bad. The Apostle Paul announced the eventual consequences of unbelief. I mentioned it earlier, it's in the book of Romans. In Romans 1.28, he wrote, Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. He then will list the things which are not fitting. Later today, you can read Romans chapter 1 at the end, and it reads like today's news. Uh, people who decide we don't want to think about God anymore. There's plenty of evidence that there is a God, but we're not going to think about that. We're going to do our own thing. We're going to do it my way. We're all going to be little Frank Sinatras. And then and you see this, they call it a downward spiral in Romans. You see the depravity that 
that the human race gets into once they reject God. Debased is translated depraved or reprobate. We should recognize that a great many of the leaders and influencers in our nation and society and in the world are debased, depraved reprobates. I mean, you know, everyone's a sinner, but now we're into real deep reprobation. Christians are oppressed by a culture of unbelief, and it's getting worse and worse and worse. Theologian Karl Barth said, belief cannot argue with unbelief. It can only preach to it. Now, we're all for uh, apologetics and giving an answer to every man. We're, we're not backing away from that. But what Barth is saying is that when you have somebody who is a radical, critical non-believer who is spewing things that are unreasonable, who, who can't even with common sense see what's right before them in terms of the contradictions of their position, that person can't be argued with, they need the gospel. They need to hear about Jesus Christ. And luckily, Paul said before he announces this depravity, a little bit earlier in Romans, he says, for the gospel is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Gentile. And so he sets that up. He says, hey, you, we share the power of the gospel. We have this power in earthen vessels, this treasure, right? And he says, now, we need that because here's what's going to happen when a society turns its back on God. And you're not going to be able to reason your way out of it because the people who are otherwise intelligent are making morons of themselves. And, and so you need to preach the gospel because that's what they need. They need the transformation. It's our greatest weapon. Chapter 12, you press on by believing. Let's say a thousand years from now, archaeologists discover the ruins of our building. Something's happened and, you know, Hanford is gone, Kings County is gone, everything's under rubble and they have to dig, you know, those digs with the little uh, paintbrushes and stuff. So they find, of all the churches in town, they find Calvary Chapel. What conclusions might they come to about all the 21st century churches? if they found just our church? Well, they would conclude at least two things. One, that it wasn't necessary to wear your Sunday best to church. In fact, most of us dress down for church. Two, churches put a high priority on coffee. And so they would write these scholarly articles with those conclusions in mind, and of course that's crazy. The first century customs regarding the head covering of women are like that. The experts disagree. We cannot say with certainty that Mary wore a head covering or that she acted inappropriately by letting her hair down. It is instructive that no one at the table suggested letting her hair down was wrong. No one said, oh, no, you can't do that. Look at what you've done. The only person who had a problem with it was Judas, and it was monetary. And so chapter 12, verse 1, then six days before the Passover, so this is the Saturday night before Palm Sunday, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. The countdown to the Lamb of God's last Passover had started. We read in Galatians, the fullness of the time had come and God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. Jesus came at the exact right time from all different points of view in order to be that Passover lamb for us. Verse 2, then they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Jesus was guest of honor at Lazarus's coming out party. They undoubtedly came out of the tomb, right? He, he came out, a very, pop, a very powerful coming out. They undoubted. Lee, uh, Dudley had a ton of food left over from the funeral, right? I mean, I don't know if you've ever endured funeral food, but, I mean, it just keeps coming. You know, people want to be nice, and, and it's a great thing, and you've got, you got casserole after casserole. You have to buy another refrigerator sometimes <laughs> for all the food you have. Why have it go to waste? It was Saturday, the Sabbath, the eve of Palm Sunday, as I said. The fact Martha served lets us know it was in their home. Verse 3, then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, 
and the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. The diners would be reclining on pillows around a low table, their bare feet extended away from the table, making them accessible. D.A. Carson writes, its purity, quantity, and origin account for its appalling cost. When John labels it an expensive perfume, he is thinking on a scale far larger than what we might mean by those words. Kings were anointed usually by pouring oil over their heads. Historians do cite that it was not unheard of to anoint the feet of a king, although it was rare. And so Mary treated Jesus as her king. And it was appropriate because in a few hours, the people were going to gather along the road and proclaim Jesus king. And so Mary symbolically was proclaiming him king. He was her friend. He was her pastor, we might say. He was a dinner guest. He was many things. But at that moment, she treated him as the king of kings. The appropriate posture before the king was kneeling face down at his feet and anointing him with luxurious and sweet-smelling ointment. I'm going to guess, take a wild guess, and say there were towels available to her, right? I mean, this was her house. Uh, they were serving dinner. They must have had towels. Thus, her behavior must be symbolic. You didn't see Mary using a towel. She was the towel. Now, that sounds a little weird at first, but remember, John the Baptist claimed he was what? A voice crying in the wilderness. He said, look, when you, when you see me, you don't see me. You don't see John the Baptist. You only hear a voice that is bringing glory to God. Paul the Apostle in the New Testament will say that Christians are like utensils in a great house. And it's the same kind of an idea. If you're doing something... Uh, let's say you're stirring somebody up to love and good works. You're a spoon in God's hands. So people don't see you. They just see the spoon. And so when you looked over at Mary and you thought, what's she doing with her hair? That's what a towel does. She's saying, hey, you don't really see me. I want to lose myself in Jesus. And you see the towel. And, and I minister his glory in that way. And so she offered herself to him as a towel. If using her hair suggests any intimacy, it is a pure godly intimacy of love for Jesus Christ and from Jesus Christ. I am my beloved's and he is mine. And we don't need to back away from that. Verse 4, but one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, that he, uh, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had, put, uh, had control of the money box, and he used to take what was put in it. And so Judas didn't have any accountability. These guys must have been too busy to attend Larry Burkett or Dave Ramsey seminars, you know, and so they, they just did whatever they, you know, hey, Judas, you're keeping the money, okay? I'm sure he volunteered for it, uh, and, but and he would steal from it. John is drawing an obvious contrast between the material worth of the ointment versus the spiritual worth of the anointing. Charles Spurgeon said, it is our duty and our privilege to exhaust our lives for Jesus. We are not to be living specimens of men in fine preservation, but living sacrifices whose lot is to be consumed. Verse seven, Jesus said, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. Mary had kept the ointment for a special occasion. She didn't know that in a week's time Jesus would be dead. Nevertheless, it's accurate to say that this was the occasion and it was for Jesus' burial. She just did it ahead of time because there wouldn't be an opportunity to do it later. And so she doesn't know all this, but we do now as the reader. And so uh, she, Jesus is saying, hey, it's okay. You anoint for burial. This is to anoint me as king and for my coming sacrifice. For the poor you will have with you always, but me you do not have always. There would be plenty of time to minister to the poor and to do other types of ministry as well. In fact, Jesus would tell them that they were going to do a lot more than he had done when he left them and sent them the Holy Spirit. And you know what? The Lord will provide for it too. They, they don't need, in that sense, the money from this ointment that could have been sold for a year's wages or more. Uh, you know, if, if God wants to use it to anoint his son, then rather than to feed poor people, 
uh, you know, you have to weigh out the, uh, you know, the scales, I guess, but ultimately you have to do what God tells you to do. Should we have a building? Some would say no. Some would say it's, you know, this or that. I mean, if God leads you in a certain direction, you go in that direction. Uh, and you make those decisions, right? And so uh, Jesus is saying, hey, this is actually the best use of this ointment for all the reasons that I say, and plus it's going to be a really great Bible story. The use of money ought to follow biblical principles, but with the understanding that there are times when God overrules for his glory and your growth. Now, a great many of the Jews knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. This is one of those step right up and see the man who rose from the dead situations. It's like a carnival thing almost. I want to see Lazarus. Can we see Lazarus? You wanted to be the grandpa that said to your grandson, I saw Lazarus. He was alive. Alive, I say. But anyway, and while we're on the subject, no one is named Lazarus anymore. Why is that? I'm, no, I'm serious. He's a great character. The only two Lazarus, first of all, it was a common name in the New Testament. Secondly, the only two Lazaruses we know, the, one was a beggar, bad lot in life, but he ends up in paradise, right? And the other one is Jesus' friend who comes forth from the grave. I mean, so I expect some babies coming, not out of the tomb, but out of the womb, <laughs> to be named Lazarus. We can call them lazy and think of all the nicknames and fun we can have. Tomb Raider. Uh, it's not often you see a dead man come to life. If you're a believer, you are a dead man who has come to eternal life. Put yourself on display. What do people see when they see you? Verse 10, but the chief priest plotted to put Lazarus to death also because on account of him, many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus Lazarus was evidence that a formidable sign had been performed. Eliminate him and they could sell the lie that it was a hoax. Or they could pressure people and say, hey, if you say one more word about Lazarus, you're going to be excommunicated. John is going to tell us nine times in this gospel, many believed. The scripture in Acts I always love, he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and determine their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. And so however that works out, I mean, I don't understand how the Lord scatters people to places where it's difficult to hear the gospel and then says, I did that so that they would hear the gospel and seek me. But the point I'm trying to make right now is that our God is a seeking God. He wants many to believe. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to eternal life. But we know that all don't, and we you know, understand the reasons and all of that. But always fall on the character of God as being an evangelistic God, a loving God, a, a reaching God, a God that can be sought and found by whosoever will. You've heard the expression, let your hair down. Linguists say it came from the 1600s with big stacked hair on women, that they'd let it down to be more natural. It's come to mean relax or chill out. Maybe we should reintroduce it in its biblical sense by jumping at opportunities to serve the Lord. Oh, would that person, that person went to the mission field? Yeah, they let their hair down and went for it. They, they became less stuffy, more natural, and just let the Lord lead them. Mary seemed extreme. In the end, what she did was her reasonable service to the king. It, it wasn't extreme at all. It's not like the disciples washing Jesus' feet where they refused to do it because it was lowly. It was just something that she was prompted to do, and she did it. I mean, they shouldn't have all... Peter, you know, God didn't want, uh, you know, Peter to wash Jesus' feet with his beard or anything like that. And so it was, it was unique to her, but nevertheless, it was her reasonable service to her king. One thing we must emphasize is that your reasonable service is going to be costly. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean finances, although it can. The rich young ruler, for example, was hindered from worshiping the Lord because he had much wealth. And, and to him, Jesus said, look, in your case, your wealth is getting in the way of your walk. And, and so you know, Jesus, knowing his heart, said, you're going to have to divest yourself of all you know, your worldly possessions. But that was a unique situation. 
In the Old Testament, King David once described costly by saying, I cannot offer the Lord my God a sacrifice that cost me nothing. So there's always a cost if you want to be a living sacrifice, which is your reasonable service. One thing that I'll mention in passing, many of you have experienced this and still are, it's a cost of following King Jesus, your family, as in your unsaved family. Usually there's a, a new wedge, a new barrier between you because you love the Lord more than you love them, and they know that. And, and uh, that's just the way it cuts. I mean, but you love them so much in the Lord that you want them to join you in eternity, and just it becomes that problem that we talked about earlier. And so it's costly. You know, you need to, we talk about counting the cost. You know, and, and uh, it'd be like saying, hey, I know you want to get saved, but hang on. You know, God might want all your money. He might want to, you know, do this. He might want to do that. Doesn't matter because we never give up anything. We always gain. You have a problem in your family. You, you, you know, you, your family doesn't understand you. They turn against you. They, you're not as close as you were. You have dozens of people in your spiritual family at a local church, maybe hundreds, maybe thousands, billions in eternity, Right? You, you, God gives you fathers and mothers and grandfathers and grandmothers, as it were, in the body of Christ. And you're, you're closer, spiritually speaking, because you're all baptized into the same body. And so we don't really give up anything. We think we do, and we're sad about it, but we gain when we come to Christ. But it is costly from an earthly point of view. At the foot of the cross, anything following Jesus might cost, it has to seem insignificant. Amen? Amen.